You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. This is the Useless Information Podcast. I am Steve Silverman. Useless Information. So I was sitting in my local public library the Friday before Christmas, you know, writing a few of the tidbits that I always include in each episode. Well, one story I started to write had been in my collection of articles, I'm guessing, for more than a decade. And every once in a while, you know, I come across it, take a quick glance down, and, you know, just kind of shove it right back into the folder. But not this time. There was something about the story that just caught my attention, and I decided to research it further. I was shocked by what I found out. Now, without giving too much away... I will tell you that in the 25 plus years that I've been researching the offbeat, the bizarre, and the long forgotten, this was the very first story that ever truly haunted me. I just couldn't get it out of my head. So be forewarned. This story has a sudden and possibly upsetting turn to it. For now, I'll just refer to what happened as the incident and leave it at that. You know, they say that hindsight is twenty twenty. so all of the quotations that you're about to hear were made by those involved after the incident occurred. The subject of today's story is a young woman named Linda Marie Alt. Shortly after her graduation from Flowing Wells High School in Tucson, Arizona, 17-year-old Linda married Ronald Wayne Loomis on August 8th of 1964. Sadly, the marriage wouldn't last. So in 1966, Linda moved back in with her parents. That's Dorothy and Joseph Alt, who had by this time relocated to 4720 East Beverly in Phoenix. You know, it's always difficult to know what really goes on behind closed doors, but various newspaper accounts piece together an image in which the Alt household became a generational battle between traditional conservative parents and a liberal daughter who reached adulthood during the 1960s sexual revolution. Mrs. Alt blamed the failure of her daughter's marriage mainly on the fact that Linda had been intimate with at least half a dozen men during that time period. Her promiscuity continued after moving back home, and what Mrs. Alt referred to as, quote, traditional methods were used to avoid the chance of pregnancy. This included having Linda constantly walk upright for about a week, and another time they forced her to ride horseback for approximately one month. Linda enrolled as a student at Arizona State University, but they also were having a very difficult time getting her to study. Instead, Linda increasingly worked on making herself more enticing to the opposite sex. At one point, she was awarded a scholarship but instead requested that she be allowed to use the money to purchase contact lenses so she could ditch her cat's eye style glasses. During the spring of 1967, Linda called the police to report a domestic disturbance at the Alt House. Sheriff Deputy Jack Barnaby responded and witnessed, quote, One of the most violent family fights I have ever seen. He added that Mrs. Alt was... She was extremely belligerent, and that she had threatened to commit suicide. After this incident occurred, Mrs. Alt underwent psychiatric treatment and was considered to be just fine. Some ten months later, on the evening of Friday, February 2nd, 1968, Linda left the house to go to a dance. When she didn't return home that night, her parents became concerned and made a telephone call to one of her friends who informed them that Linda had left the dance with a man. The Alts became frantic and spent the remainder of the night driving through the Tempe, Phoenix area, searching for her car, but they were unsuccessful. Linda walked back into the house at 9.30 the next morning with a big smile on her face. When asked to explain where she had been, Linda stated she had spent an intimate night at the apartment of a Williams Air Force Base lieutenant named Joseph Cunningham. Linda argued she was 21 years old and that she could do as she pleased. Of course, this made her parents even more furious, and they forced Linda to telephone Lieutenant Cunningham and tell him that he had to marry her. 
Their plan was very simple. The two would head off to Las Vegas for a quickie marriage, you know, and should Linda eventually be found not to be expecting a child, well then the marriage could be annulled. Lieutenant Cunningham agreed to come to the house to talk things over, but if he had any thought about talking himself out of the impending nuptials, he was mistaken. That's because Mr. Alt decided that he needed some sort of forceful persuasion to make sure that the two really married. So shortly after the telephone conversation ended, he drove to a pawn shop and purchased a 22 caliber revolver. He stated, The main reason I got the gun was to get the man to marry Linda. He added, If we could show him the gun, he'll take her to Las Vegas and marry her. Well, that was never to happen. While Mr. Alt was out shopping for the weapon, Lieutenant Cunningham called back and told Mrs. Alt that he wouldn't be coming to their house to discuss what happened because he was already married. Well, so much for the shotgun wedding idea. For the next day or so, the Alts continued to press their daughter to express remorse for what she had done, but Linda was not giving in. So one of the first things that her parents did was to take her over to her college and force Linda to withdraw from her classes. This was followed by walking around the neighborhood and forcing her to remain standing on her feet all day Saturday in an effort to abort a possible pregnancy. At one point, Linda started to run and wouldn't listen to me. So Mrs. All picked up a branch from a mesquite tree and whacked her on the back of her head twice. Linda then ran to a nearby gas station at 4300 East Baseline and called the police for help. Responding officer K.A. Roberts later testified that he'd observed a blood trail that started at the back of Linda's head, ran down her neck, and then separated into a V-shaped pattern between her shoulders. Linda refused to sign a complaint against her mother and returned back home. But things just worsened from there. Later that evening, Mr. Alt discovered Linda with a dull butcher knife pointed towards her stomach, claiming that she didn't have the strength to kill herself. Dad commented, Oh, you're grandstanding again. So he grabbed the knife and hid it away to prevent any further harm. He also hid his newly purchased gun under the mattress, you know, just in case he decided to try to use it to grab their attention with it once again. Yet by Sunday morning, Linda still had not expressed any remorse for her actions. So the parents decided they had to teach her a valuable lesson. You know, one that would be memorable. One that she would forever regret. One that would cause her to truly reflect on what she had done. Their solution... Linda would have to kill her beloved dog, Beauty, a black-and-white mongrel that she had owned for about two years. Mrs. Alt stated, I told Linda that after all she put so many people through, and her not suffer, that maybe she would suffer over an animal. Well, we're going to take a short break here to hear a few words from the sponsor of today's episode, but when we return, you will hear the shocking turn that the story will take. Welcome back. Just before the break, we learned that the Alts had come up with the ultimate punishment for their daughter Linda's behavior. She would have to kill her dog. Well, shortly before 11 a.m. that Sunday morning, Linda walked with Beauty one last time to a spot about 500 feet or 150 meters on the desert floor behind their home. As Linda and Mrs. Alt took turns digging a grave to bury Beauty in, Mr. Alt fired the gun into a cactus to be certain that it operated properly. He then loaded the revolver with seven rounds and left the hammer on an empty chamber. At this point, Mr. Alt walked about 50 feet or 15 meters to tie the couple's other dog to a bush. Mrs. Alt then knelt down next to the grave that they had dug and held Beauty by her leash. She was looking down towards the dog, but through the corner of her eye, she could see the barrel of the gun coming toward the dog. She said, You have to put it right against her head. And with another glance out of the corner of her eye, 
Mrs. All could see Linda withdrawing the gun away from Beauty's head and sensed that her daughter was hesitating on pulling the trigger. And then, BOOM! Mrs. All suddenly screamed, My God, my God, she shot herself! Yes, instead of shooting her dog, Linda had turned the gun toward her right temple and pulled the trigger. She shot herself! Baby, baby, help me! Mr. Alt ran toward his daughter and carried her back to the house. Mrs. Alt dialed the operator in a frantic attempt to get an ambulance or the police, but time was ticking away fast. Sheriff's Deputy Jack Barnaby arrived on the scene a short time later and cautiously entered the house with his gun ready. Remember, he had been the officer who had responded to that violent fight at the Alt home some ten months earlier. As a result, he didn't know what to expect he found that no one was home. That was because the Alts had made the decision to drive Linda directly to the Tempe Community Hospital themselves. But her condition was so grave that she was transferred to St. Joseph's Hospital in Phoenix. Sadly, she did not survive. Linda died the next morning on February 5th of 1968. She was 21 years old. Now, while the couple lived just outside the Phoenix city limits, the shooting took place within its boundaries. As a result, the couple was questioned by Phoenix police and were fully cooperative. Mr. Alt stated, I handed her the gun. I didn't think she would do anything like that. Mrs. Alt was quoted as saying, I thought she was just stalling. She continued, I killed her. I killed her. It's just like I killed her myself. The press quickly picked up on the story about the college sophomore who had opted to take her life over that of her innocent dog. Suddenly, Mr. and Mrs. Alt were thrust into the national spotlight. And when questioned by reporters, Mr. Alt replied, We told the police and the sheriff's office everything. You can get it all from them. Two days later, the Alts were testifying at a coroner's inquest. The couple was questioned by Chief Deputy County Attorney Moise Berger, who asked Mrs. Alt, Did you or did you not know that she was four days past her menstrual period and there was no possibility she was pregnant? Mrs. Alt replied that she was aware of that fact. When asked why Linda agreed to calling and asking Lieutenant Cunningham to marry her, Mrs. Alt stated, She finally understood there was more involved than just him and her in an act like that. You have responsibilities. Just before he left the witness stand, Mr. Alt asked to make a statement. I don't believe my daughter meant to kill herself. I don't think she thought her father would load the gun, that he would let her shoot the dog. The hearing lasted approximately two hours, and the jury of five men and one woman ruled that Linda had chosen to take her own life. Her death was ruled a suicide. Now, one would think that that would have been the end of the story, but it wasn't. Attorney Berger said that there were still some unanswered questions and that the investigation would continue. And that's exactly what they did. At 5 p.m. on February 9th, that's four days after their daughter's death, three sheriff's deputies arrested the Alts at their home. They were charged with involuntary manslaughter and were held on $20,000 bond. Adjusted for inflation, that's approximately $143,000 each today. The couple both pled innocent to the charges, but should they ultimately be convicted, they were facing a sentence of 1 to 10 years in prison. The rationale for the charges were that the couple were well aware that their daughter had attempted to take her own life with a kitchen knife the night before the shooting. So by handing Linda a loaded gun the next day, the couple had broken Arizona law by knowingly assisting another person to commit suicide. Attorney Berger stated, Basically, the facts show they were aware of their daughter's emotional state and did give her a loaded gun. This does show a failure to exercise due caution under the circumstances. The Alts lawyer argued that their bomb was excessively high. 
He pointed out that Mr. Alt had been a 20-year employee of the El Paso Natural Gas Company, and both husband and wife had strong roots in the community. Neither could be considered flight risks, so bond was reduced to $2,500 each, and they were released pending trial. As if things weren't bad enough for the Alts, on February 27th, their 21-year-old son, Howard Eugene, who was a Vietnam veteran, he was sentenced to a term of one year to one year and a day in prison for forging a check on October 7th of 1967. Surprisingly, the judge admitted that Howard's chances for probation were weakened by the legal mess that his parents were in. Just as the Alts' trial was to begin on May 21st, Superior Court Judge William A. Hollihan ruled that all of the testimony that the couple had given during that initial coroner's inquest could not be introduced as evidence at their manslaughter trial. The rationale for this ruling was that the Alts had been advised by Justice of the Peace Stanley Kimball over the telephone that it wasn't necessary for the couple to have an attorney at the inquest, yet they clearly should have had one. After one and a half days of testimony before a jury of five women and seven men, the prosecution rested its case. The defense then argued that the county had failed to prove the couple was guilty of involuntary manslaughter, and the judge agreed. He dismissed the jury and directed a verdict of acquittal. While the alts may have been cleared of any charges in a court of law, I can't imagine how awful it must have been for them to live with the guilt for the rest of their lives. It's an incredible burden to carry and not one that I would wish upon anyone. I'll conclude with a message of appreciation that appeared on page 44 of the February 15, 1968 publication of the Arizona Republic. Quote, We wish to express our heartfelt thanks and appreciation for the acts of kindness, messages of sympathy, and the beautiful floral offerings received from our many friends in our time of sorrow in the loss of our beloved daughter and sister, Linda Marie Alt, the Alt family. Useless, useful, I'll leave that for you to decide. Quick help to softer, smoother, lovelier looking skin. That's Noxima's promise to you girls with facial problems, like rough, dry skin or externally caused blemishes. You see, Noxema is a medicated formula, a real aid to healing. Noxema helps smooth and soften rough, dry skin, helps heal ugly externally caused blemishes quick. And I mean quick. Prove it for yourself. Apply Noxema night and morning. It's greaseless, non-sticky, quickly vanishes into the pores to form an ideal base for powder. And what a thrill when you discover how quickly Noxema helps your skin become lovelier to look at, softer to touch. So don't wait. Get Noxema skin cream right away. That commercial for Noxema is from the May 25, 1946 broadcast of The Mayor of the Town. The show starred Lionel Barrymore and Agnes Moorhead, and this is long before she played her best-known role, which was in Dora on the classic TV show Bewitched, one of my favorites growing up. This particular episode was titled Memorial Day Parade. Noxima was formulated in the early 20th century by Dr. Francis Townsend of Ocean City, Maryland. He gave it the catchy name Townsend R22, and sold it to tourists so they could use it to relieve their sunburn pain. At some point, the formula ended up in the hands of a man named Dr. George Bunting. Some say that Townsend gave Bunting the formula, while others say Bunting simply copied it and marketed it as his own version. His original factory wasn't much of a factory at all. He mixed up batches of the product in a coffee pot in his home at 102 East Lafayette Avenue in Baltimore. Sales of what he called Dr. Bunting's sunburn remedy were initially small, but soon people were finding other uses for it and it became known as the Miracle Cream of Baltimore. The story goes that a customer told Dr. Bunting that, quote, your product knocked out my eczema, and soon the product had a new name. Noxema. The origin of the name is not entirely obvious until you try breaking it into smaller bits. No, 
eczema, no eczema, or as we normally pronounce it, noxema. And through endless advertising, Dr. Bunting built Noxema into a powerhouse of a brand, and the company eventually looked to expand into different product markets. Perhaps the most successful of these attempts was made in the 1960s when the company launched CoverGirl Cosmetics. Now, when I was a kid, every teenage girl seemed to have a bottle of Noxema. And I have to tell you that distinct smell, that's yeah, something that will be implanted in my memory forever. Ever. But oddly, the product is nearly non existent today. So, what happened? Well, no one can say for sure, but if you had to pinpoint the main cause of its precipitous decline, it would probably all be traced back to 1989. That's when the company was sold for $1.3 billion to Procter and Gamble. From what I read, Procter and Gamble didn't really want Noxema they purchased the company for its CoverGirl line. And from that point on, Procter & Gamble did little to promote Noxema. The Noxema facial cream line was sold to Alberto Culvert in 2008 for $81 million. Think how little that is compared to what Procter & Gamble paid for the company. Two years later, Alberto Culver was acquired by Unilever, and that's where Noxema resides today. Going back to our main story, when Linda also tragically turned that gun toward herself, her parents really had no choice but to call the telephone operator for help. A national 911 emergency system was not in place at the time. So here's a question for you. In what year was the first 911 call made in the United States? I'll let you think about that for a bit, and I will let you know the answer at the end of this podcast. In other news, here are a few stories from the past about our canine friends. In our first story dated April 5th, 1921, a man brought his dog into the Animal Rescue League in Washington, D.C. to have his pet euthanized. Lion, who was a large furry combination of part sheepdog and part St. Bernard, well, he was suffering badly. He wouldn't eat, he lacked energy, and he stood with his head hanging low. After a brief examination, attendants at the facility discovered that he was being strangled by a piece of fishing line that was wrapped around his throat. Now, it must have happened when Lion was a small puppy since his skin had grown around it. So the fishing line was cut and the excess skin was burned away. The dog suddenly regained his pep and offers poured in from all around to give him a new home. But it was ultimately decided to keep him in the Animal League facility. Our next story took place on September 13th of 1930 in a Minneapolis, Minnesota courtroom. There, a man named Morris Epstein was suing Ben Stillman because his police dog had bitten him. Epstein was asking for $75 or about $1,100 today, for his pain and suffering. Stillman objected, and that's not only because he didn't want to pay the money, but because there was absolutely no way the dog could have done so much damage. And to prove it, Stillman showed the judge the dog's mouth. He was completely toothless. As you can probably guess, the judge ruled in favor of Stillman and his unnamed dog. Lastly, we have the story of Duke. He's a black and white Springer Spaniel who made the national news way back in January of 1936. It seems that one day his owner, that's E.C. McKenzie, forgot to feed Duke. You know, so Duke moseyed on down to the local grocery store because he remembered that's where his owner purchased his food. Duke was starving, so he barked for food and received a meal in exchange. And after that first visit, Duke would go to the store every single day, and the market's owner, that's O.J. Dury, he would feed him either a can of dog food or two pounds of hamburger. So you're probably wondering how Duke paid for his meals. Well, Mr. McKenzie opened a charge account for Duke to purchase his food with. Sadly, it was reported on March 22nd of 1937, 
that's a little over one year after his initial brush with fame, Duke passed away at eight years of age. A vet attributed his death at such a young age to overeating. So a few minutes ago, I asked you if you knew when the first 911 emergency call was made. Did you know? Well, the first known use of a national emergency number began in Great Britain back in 1937 using the digits 999, which is still in effect today. So a push for a similar number in the United States began in the late 1950s, but it didn't gain much traction until 1967. That's when the President's Commission on Law Enforcement and Administration of Justice recommended that one universal number be used nationwide for reporting emergencies. On January 12, 1968, it was announced that AT&T, you know, which operated the vast majority of telephones within the United States, they had reached an agreement with the FCC to begin the rollout of this new system. They chose the number 911. Why? Because it was easy to remember, easy to dial, and probably most importantly, it worked well with their existing technologies. Yet, the first 911 call would not be made on the AT&T system. That's because when the president of the Alabama Telephone Company, a guy named Bob Gallagher, well, when he read this announcement in the newspaper, he was annoyed that the smaller telephone companies around the nation weren't included in the decision making. So Gallagher approached the owners of the company with a simple proposal. He wanted to beat AT&T to the punch. They agreed, and the town of Haleyville, Alabama was chosen simply because the company was working on an exchange there already. Their workers spent about one week installing the new emergency system, and it was set to go. So it was on February 16, 1968, that the first 911 call was made. Of course, there was no emergency. It was simply a ceremonial call between Alabama Representative Tom Bevel and Alabama State House Speaker Rankin Fight. But of course, it goes in the record books as the first 911 call ever made. Now, if you happen to ever be in Haleyville, be sure to stop at the City Hall. That original red rotary phone which took the first 911 call is on display there. Well, that brings another episode of the Useless Information Podcast to a close. Be sure to sign up for my new Twitter feed, that's at UselessInfoCast, and that's so you can be among the first to know when a new episode is released. Again, the Twitter handle is at UselessInfoCast. Also be sure to like the show on Facebook. All you need to do is do a quick search for Useless Information Podcast and it should pop up. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, TuneIn, or really through any of the leading podcast platforms. The Useless Information Podcast is part of the Recorded History Podcast Network. Be sure to go to recordedhistory.net to learn about all of the quality history podcasts that the network has to offer. Anyway, thanks for listening, and I hope you tune in the next time. Bye!